There are honestly just so many people that don't really understand what they're doing with Kokomi, and I think that's where part of the negativity comes from when people are talking about her not being a great unit. I'll be honest, I think Kokomi is an amazing unit. I said it. I know people are still riding the Copium High from skipping her first banner, but she's really not that bad. I wouldn't call her a necessary unit either, but she at least has a solid place in solid teams, unlike a few other Inazuma releases we've seen. If you feel like Kokomi is useless or bad, odds are that you're just either playing her incorrectly or slotting her into an incompatible team. And if that's not the case, then that's fine. Let's just agree to disagree. Now, being completely honest, she has roles she's good at, and DPS is not really one of them without a ridiculous amount of investment. If you're just defeating enemies in the overworld, then her damage isn't an issue. I'm mostly referencing high-end content. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Just because you can build a character as a DPS because it sort of works doesn't mean that that's the best way to do it. So before I talk to you about how you should be building Kokomi, keep in mind this video is based on a combination of both my experience playing the character extensively on my free-to-play account, as well as countless experiences and calculations from theory crafters, as we usually incorporate into these videos, so it's a pretty mixed and balanced bag of information. I don't want you guys to feel like you have to listen to me, because at the end of the day, you should just play the game how you want to play, but this channel has always been about trying to get the most out of the character that you're playing, so. Just as a heads up, guys, this video is not a full in-depth guide like most of my other character videos, but I am still going to get pretty detailed about what I'm talking about. So to explain how you should be building Kokomi, first you have to understand how her kit works. So I'm going to go over that really briefly, and then we'll go ahead and talk about her build. <music> Kokomi's elemental skill puts down a jellyfish that's going to tick hydro damage and apply hydro on every hit. It also heals a large portion of HP for the active character, and it lasts for 12 seconds with a 20 second cooldown. Now, 12 seconds of fairly consistent hydro application is pretty good, especially since that jellyfish is going to be ticking once every 2 seconds, so permafreeze is just really easy to run. Now, when you activate Kokomi's elemental burst, her normal attacks, charged attacks, and skill damage is going to be increased by a portion of her HP. While it's a significant jump in overall damage for Kokomi, her damage seal is still pretty low compared to other characters that you'll want to use as a carry. The one exception to this is Taser, but I'll explain that a bit later. On top of the damage increase, it allows Kokomi's normal and charged attack hits to regen HP for your whole team. It costs 70 energy to cast and lasts for 10 seconds with an 18 second cooldown. So a lot of people choose to use Kokomi for her damage, and while that can be a decent solution early on in the game, Kokomi struggles to be a powerful carry without a ton of investment from other characters. This is just in comparison to other carry units like Yula, Ganyu, Hu Tao, Ito, Shangling, Beidou, the list just goes on and on and on. There are just so many other units that deal damage better, so realistically, it's better to use Kokomi for her kit utility rather than trying to build her to be a main DPS. And her first passive ability is absolutely perfect for that because it gives her jellyfish a duration refresh, meaning that whenever you cast Kokomi's elemental burst, the jellyfish duration timer will start counting down from 12 seconds again. Because of the jellyfish's 20 second cooldown, you can effectively have 100% uptime on her jellyfish for amazing heals and consistent hydro application. Now the way that I play her and that many other freeze players use her is to only use Kokomi's burst to refresh the jellyfish duration so that way freeze and healing can be permanently active. That way you're also able to keep out your main DPS who's going to be dealing more damage than Kokomi in her burst anyways, assuming you're in a proper team setting. Now her second passive makes her burst give her normal and charged attacks extra damage based on her healing bonus, which is great for her in overworld but still not strong enough to really clear high-end content with her without someone else actually carrying like Beto for example. Now this is just the case for a majority of players, but of course there will be a smaller portion of the player base that will technically be able to 36 star abyss with Kokomi as a main DPS, and honestly, if that works for you, great. I'm just here to point out that that's not the best way to play her for most players. So again, her optimal use isn't for her personal damage, it's for her healing and hydro application. But there are other things that complement this even more, so let's talk about Kokomi's artifact sets. <laughs> A patch after Kokomi released, a new artifact set came out called the Ocean Hued Clamp Set. This set shares a two-piece effect with Maiden Beloved to give 15% healing bonus, but the four-piece effect is a lot better. Every three seconds or so, I do believe it's not exactly three seconds, when healing a character over their maximum HP, a bubble will pop up in a small area around your character to deal 90% of total overhealing as physical damage up to a maximum of 27,000 damage. This set seems insanely good, in theory, but it's not as valuable as you might think. 
First of all, this set takes 90% of overhealing. That means that within the 3 seconds, to max out the set's potential, you need to be healing 30,000 heals over 3 seconds, or 10,000 heals per second. And not just that, those heals have to be over your character's max HP. Now, hypothetically, even if you only get half that damage potential, that's still not so bad, right? That's an extra 5k damage per second. And it's AoE, so it can hit multiple enemies. But actually, no, it's not that great because it's physical damage, which a lot of enemies, especially bosses, have a resistance to. So usually, you're getting less damage than you should due to physical resistance. If Hoyaverse had made this true damage, it'd be a lot better because you'd at least be able to guarantee that you're getting the number that you overhealed, or 90% of it. But instead, you would have to build a superconduct team. But the problem with that is that there's so many cryo and electro characters that just deal more damage than Kokomi that there wouldn't really be a point in using her on field. And trust me, you're not going to be getting 9k DPS out of Clam without having Kokomi in her burst. I'd be hard pressed to say you'd even get 6k DPS out of it unless she's on the field. A more realistic number for the average player would be between 9 to 12k ticks of damage every 3 seconds or so, or an increase of between 3 and 4k DPS. And that's assuming you're going to be at maximum HP the whole time you're healing and before you count resistances. So basically, it's just really hard to get Kokomi to get a lot of value with Clam, unless she's in a very specific team setup, which again, we'll talk about in a bit. But I guess the main point here is that you're going to have other units that would prefer to be on the field over Kokomi in most Kokomi teams, and as a result, you're never going to truly reach the maximum potential of the clam set if you're playing Kokomi optimally. Now the reason that I explained all of that is because a lot of players are under the impression that the clam set is optimal for Kokomi. It is her set after all, clearly it was made for her. But as we've seen with a lot of characters, sometimes their dedicated set isn't actually what's best for them. If clam was the best option available, even if it was pretty scuffed, we'd run it anyways. But in most cases, there actually is a better set. So let me tell you about how you should be running Kokomi. You should be running Kokomi as a hydro-applying healer with the Tenacity of the Millilith set. Tenacity of the Millilith gives your entire team a 20% attack buff whenever your elemental skill deals damage. With a character like Kokomi who can have 100% uptime on her elemental skill and a wide area of damage, she's absolutely perfect for it. And the two-piece set gives an HP bonus as well, which also benefits Kokomi's healing. The tenacity set won't get you the most possible damage in her burst, but the most effective way to play Kokomi isn't for her personal damage anyways. In almost any team that isn't taser specifically, Kokomi's on-field damage gain from Clam loses to your team's damage increase from tenacity. At least if you're factoring in a realistic scenario where Kokomi is not going to be on the field the entire time, whereas Tenacity can be active the entire time. This build is also fairly low investment and doesn't take a lot of your resources to make it work. With Kokomi on this build, you should be running an HP or Energy Recharge Sands, a Hydro Damage Goblet, and a Healing Bonus Circlet. Kokomi's healing is solid without an extra HP Goblet and can be really good without the HP Sands as well, just because the scaling on it is so incredibly high. With Tenacity of the Millilith, you can squeeze a bit of damage out of her Jellyfish too without losing much healing utility just because of the small attack buff. One important thing to know about Kokomi that a lot of people overlook is her energy needs. Since she doesn't generate a lot of energy herself, she does need to have a decent energy recharge stat, which is why generally for her best role as a support, you're gonna actually want to run energy recharge on her for her sands. If you do, you can consistently refresh her jellyfish, alternating her skill and burst to keep 100% freeze up time. Now Kaching mains recommends between 180 and 200, which is a solid number to shoot for, but it will depend on the amount of enemies that you're fighting at the end of the day. Like if you just have a ton of enemies to fight in a bit, and you're getting particles from their HP, as well as just defeating them, you're gonna not have as many energy needs in general. For substats, you're gonna wanna go for energy recharge, HP percent, and attack percent. Those are gonna be the most important ones. As far as artifacts go, that's basically all you need to know. Kokomi's damage may be reduced by tenacity, but the benefits to your team are definitely worth the personal damage loss. <laughs> Now here is where there's another common misconception about Kokomi, and I can already tell that some people are going to be pretty mad about this. Everlasting Moonglow is not Kokomi's best in slot. While it is her highest damage ceiling weapon, it brings the least amount of value to your team. If you were doing all content with Kokomi solo, then yes. Technically, it is her best weapon. But because Genshin Impact is a team game, there are other weapons that suit teams better that will help you clear more difficult content and defeat bosses faster. So what is it? Is it Prototype Amber? 
Nope, it's not, because even with the bonus from Amber, Clam still isn't worth running, and Kokomi already heals so much that Prototype Amber is redundant. What about Hakushin Ring? Well, Hakushin Ring is actually super strong in Taser, but for general use it's less good since it won't activate while off the field. So what is Kokomi's best in slot? This may surprise you, or maybe it won't if you watch a lot of my videos, but Kokomi's best in slot is Thrilling Tales of Dragon Slayers, a 3-star, free-to-play accessible weapon. Kokomi's support capabilities in the right hands are already great, but with Thrilling Tales you're able to take her to the next level. First off, it has an HP% percent main stat, which will buff Kokomi's heals and in an emergency, burst damage as well. But its passive is what's really broken about it. The character you switch to after Kokomi will get a large attack bonus for about 10 seconds. At refinement 5, it's a 48% attack increase. When you're running Kokomi in freeze teams or just teams without Bennett, this attack increase becomes even more valuable. Because if you had a lot of characters or things that buffed your attack, you might not need Thrilling Tales as much. Thrilling Tales on Kokomi is absolutely insane, free to play accessible, and brings more of a damage increase to your team than forcing Moon Glow Kokomi for burst damage. I really cannot recommend it enough. There is no worst case scenario with Thrilling Tales since it's a 3 star, very easy to get, you should absolutely be running Thrilling Tales on Kokomi in almost every single team that's optimal for her. Kokomi Taser is the exception to all of this. The idea behind Kokomi Taser is that you actually will have opportunities to use her on-field damage, and by doing this you'll be able to proc electrocharged reactions and drive characters like Fischl and Beto. You can even use Yai and Raiden in Kokomi Taser and get solid value as well, though most of the time Beto is queen. On top of that, you can throw Kazuha or Sucrose into the team to debuff enemies and increase your own damage and or elemental mastery. Now of course, when you're building Kokomi to actually be on-field DPS, your artifact build should be different too. You can still opt to go with Tenacity, but you also have the ability to go with something like Ocean Hued Clam or Heart of the Depths, where you can focus entirely on her HP scaling burst. Since you'll have her on-field burst healing combined with her Jellyfish, the amount of overhealing potential your Kokomi has is significantly higher, therefore improving your Clam damage output. To further drive your heals and damage up, you can also use the weapon Everlasting Moon Glow, Hakushin Ring, or Prototype Amber. And in this specific scenario, it's not so bad. Hakushin Ring in particular is actually an awesome pick here, since both Fischl and Beto are able to snapshot buffs from Hakushin Ring with their kit, which makes Hakushin Ring's electro damage buff seem very long by comparison to the description. Also here you can opt for an HP Sands to increase your healing and damage output in burst, because with someone like Fischl or Raiden you're going to be generating enough energy to be able to use Kokomi's burst fairly often as well. Taser Kokomi is just a completely different game from her regular setup and definitely a great way to get a lot of value out of her. I definitely recommend if you want to play Kokomi as your main DPS, do a Taser comp with Kokomi. It will be worth your time. For all of Kokomi's other available teams though that aren't a Taser variant, running the build that I talked about at the beginning with Tenacity of the Millilith and Thrilling Tales is going to end up being better for you, assuming that you're playing an optimal team and not just a team of random characters you threw together for Overworld. One example of a strong team for her would be an Ayaka Freeze comp featuring Ayaka, Kokomi, a Cryo unit, and an Animo unit. Now the Animo unit would mostly just be to Swirl Cryo, which would improve Ayaka's personal damage and whoever the second Cryo is as well. Since Kokomi can heal, you don't have to run Diona and you could use someone like Rosar instead. The nice thing about Freeze with Kokomi is just, again, her Jellyfish has a potential for 100% uptime, so hypothetically, you could keep the enemies frozen permanently. Now if you have Venti, you can also opt for a variant on Morgana featuring Ganyu, Kokomi, Akryo, and Venti, which is essentially the same formula as Ayaka Freeze, but the main difference would be that Venti is able to group all the enemies up, which would make your Ganyu do insane amounts of damage with their charge attacks because they have AoE to them and would hit all of the enemies in the burst consistently, which would make her damage significantly better than Ayaka's charge attack damage. However, of course, Ayaka's burst will deal an absurd amount of damage over a short period of time, so you could also replace Ganya with Ayaka as well. Either one of them would work, but because you also have that open cryo spot, you could just run both. You could honestly just have Ganyu out on the field doing main DPS while Ayaka's burst is going, and you're probably going to speedrun Abyss with absolutely no problems, assuming the enemy can be frozen and isn't getting knocked away. Now, a lot of people get confused about running Kokomi and Morgana because a lot of the value of Morgana is having Mona to buff your damage. Because with Mona specifically, you can 
can extend her elemental burst omen duration, the debuff that's going to give you extra damage against the enemies just by freezing enemies with the omen when they already have a cryo aura on them. And that is extremely valuable. But the idea with this variant of Morgana is that you're replacing Mona with a dedicated healer, and then you can replace Diona with a dedicated damage dealer, which in the end would actually end up buffing your damage more, especially after you factor in Tenacity of the Millilith, which is going to be on almost the entire fight, specifically because you can have 100% uptime with Kokomi. But with that being said, it obviously depends on what characters you have available. Now, another Kokomi option is going to be Sukokomon, but the one issue with Sukokomon is that it's very hard to play optimally. The team features Kokomi, Sucrose, Fischl, and Shangling, and requires you to build Shangling to have a lot of energy recharge, as well as follow a very specific rotation in order to get the most damage possible. Now, if I went into how to play Sukokomon, this video would last another 15 minutes, so I'm not going to do that, but there's lots of great resources on Sukokomon, and even if you don't follow the exact rotation, the team can still be pretty decent, but let me tell you, if you do take the time to learn it, it is absolutely game-changing. That team is so very strong. And these aren't the only Kokomi teams that you can run, but these are just some examples of optimal teams for Kokomi, things that work very, very well. And these are in addition to Taser as well, but Taser is the one team that is the exception to what I was talking about with the build earlier. Because with Taser, you're actually going to be building Kokomi for damage, but outside of Taser, it really does feel like sort of a waste of Kokomi's usefulness to try to force her to be a main DPS when she can be such an amazing supporting unit for the rest of your team. Anyways, you guys, with all that being said, I wanted to make this quick video in order to tell you guys kind of how Kokomi should be played, since a lot of players are forcing her to be a main DPS, while they could be getting a lot more value out of her by building her to be a support. Whether or not you decide to listen to me is just completely up to you. You can play Kokomi how you want, but if there's been any confusion or if you thought that Kokomi was a bad unit because her damage wasn't that amazing, hopefully this video helped you get some better understanding of how you can play her and optimize her for your team. Anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to go follow the Twitch at twitch.tv slash and I will catch you guys later. Peace!